Have you ever wondered what the true meaning of Christmas is for us? That's what we'll talk about today. All the Christmas presents in the world are worth nothing without the presence of Christ. David Jeremiah. Today we're going to talk about the book, Hidden Christmas, The Surprising Truth Behind the Birth of Christ by Timothy Keller. Timothy Keller is a pastor and a avid book writer. I've never actually read any of his books, so I was excited to try this first one. Christmas kind of snuck up on me. I had a pretty busy November, and suddenly it is right before Christmas time. So the topic of a Christmas book is appropriate. What's confusing about Christmas, and the book starts out this way, is that it's a major, obviously religious holiday. It means everything to us with the birth of Jesus. So it's of the utmost importance that we have Christmas and we understand what it's about. But there's a secular holiday as well. Growing up Jewish, I didn't celebrate Christmas. My parents weren't big into holidays in general. I don't know that we celebrated any holidays other than birthdays. And being a new Christian at the time, I had no Christmas traditions. So for me, it's always been a very religious holiday. And I wonder, too, what does it mean when we see the secular Christmas around us? Should we shun it? Should we ignore it? Should we take part of it and take part in both? How exactly should this secular Christmas play a part in our lives? And you notice more and more that not only did Christmas become more secular, this whole Black Friday sale thing has taken over the entire month of November. And then Christmas songs became less about the religious tradition and more about jingle bells and ho-ho-hos. I've never been a big fan of Santa in general. When I was a kid, I asked Santa where he got his suit. Was it Marshall Field? I never did dig this whole idea of Santa delivering all the presents. How does that work in time? My dad, who's a sci-fi nut, tried to explain that it could possibly be time travel, but I didn't believe that either. But now I see Christmas around, and it used to share a place in the public square. I would get ornaments that were of a more religious variety. To me, Christmas is a religious holiday. And it was mixed in, so I could find a little bit of both. Find that jalapeno ornament and find the ornament of Jesus Christ. However, now I'm not finding the religious holiday at all. I'm not hearing the religious music. And I'm not really finding ornaments and other things unless I go to hand crafters that are either an Etsy or other locally made places. It is now seeming that the secular word is pushing out the Christmas message. We used to be able to share a spot. So it feels like we're losing a grip on Christmas entirely. I plan on keeping it as foremost a religious holiday, but should I partake in the other parts? And while he thinks that it's unfortunate that it is losing its religiosity, and obviously it's devastating to us to see Christmas become something entirely not Christmas, there are some themes in there that still always will reflect Jesus. There are a million and one descriptions about light and dark. And so Christmas lights represent the hope of the world. And whenever we see the lights, we think of the star, we think of the light of Jesus coming into the world, and the amazing act he did to die for us so that we could have salvation. There's nothing wrong with kindness, gifts cheer, a family celebration, and every once in a while that Christmas message leaks out of the secular Christmas. I think about Charlie Brown. When I was a kid and the Charlie Brown Christmas special talked about Luke's passage, it stunned me a bit because you don't really hear that often, the Christian message in a secular cartoon. But I imagine it meant a lot to Charles Schultz and it made me think as well. Now when I see it, it warms my heart. You know, we see all the gifts, and it went from giving gifts and being kind to other people to buying ourselves 20 gifts and then buying everyone else some gifts, too. But being charitable and having Christmas gifts, there's nothing wrong with that either. And he says that when you understand the Christmas message in general, you understand the whole gospel. You understand why Jesus is important. And that Jesus came for the people living in darkness. From Matthew, who was quoting Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. 
and that we do have the true light visiting us in this world. He says that when we hear the word darkness, it tends to mean evil or even maybe ignorance or the lack of understanding and that the world is filled with a lot of suffering. Darkness looks bad. There's always that one joke about the drunk guy who lost his keys and he was looking under a light pole for his keys. And so a police officer came by and said, well, is this where you lost your keys? He says, oh, no, I lost it in the dark alley, but I can't see a thing back there. As human beings, we are drawn to the light. And when we want to see something true or find lost keys, we're drawn to the light. And part of our problem, he says today, is that we expect that we're going to fix our world, that if we only do this better and do that better, we have the ability to fix everything, fix all the ills in our world. But as Christians who looked back at Eden and looked at the original sin and the fallenness of humanity and what we lost in Eden and look towards heaven where we're going to have that perfection, we realize there's no fixing what's going wrong on earth. He talks about how the New York Times mentions that the meaning of Christmas is that love and peace will transcend everything. And of course, we know it won't. Not on this time, not until we reach heaven. We can have light, we can have peace, and we can have love, but it won't be until the very end, when Jesus returns again, that it will transcend this planet. There's always going to be sin, and there's always going to be things that are wrong. I always kind of laugh at the song Imagine by John Lennon, because he thinks that if all those things disappeared, we would have heaven on earth. He wouldn't say that because he didn't believe it, but we would have peace and love and all the things. And you know what? If we didn't have countries and religion and all the other things we fight about, we would fight about whether our blue jeans were blue enough. We, we would fight if that flower over there was my flower or your flower. We're never going to get away from those things, not until Jesus comes again. And sure, a lot of books, and I've read them by Steven Pinker and some others that talk about we're in unprecedented time of peace and progress. But we also know that we went from wars that would last decades, but would kill tens of thousands of people to knowing that we could kill a million people with a keystroke, with a joystick, that our ability to destroy each other has never been greater. And so we need the Jesus who cares for us. And he cares about what's going on with us. He cares about what's happening on this planet and with his people. And the people of his time, when they saw who Jesus was claiming to be, God, that's when he had to go. We had this tight little Roman society. Everything was going our way. People were behaving. We had local leadership through the temple through secular government that was controlling what was happening and Jesus was just going to shake things up. But you know what? God came here, born in a major, to shake things up. He is a God that understands us and wants to be among us. And you know there's no other religion like that. We've seen Greek and Roman religions where Zeus and other gods came to earth, but they weren't here to understand us. They were here to mess with us and make our lives miserable or change an outcome that was insulting to them. This person insulted me in their offering, so I'm going to show them the smackdown. That's not why Jesus is here. He is here so that he can let us know that he understands suffering and sorrow and death. And that Timothy Keller says, quote, the courage to take his own medicine. He can exact nothing from man that has not been exacted from himself. He has gone through everything that we're going through. He was given pain. He was abandoned by his friends. He was tempted. He was treated unfairly by government officials and even by lowly criminals. Even the other criminal on the cross was mocking him. Can you get any lower when a guy who is being put to death mocks you? So this light that comes to us, the sun, it says, is a gift, which means that it is the ultimate Christmas gift, a gift that can teach us to lose our pride, that to understand that suffering and death is something that God suffered along with us, and that we're not people who can fix everything on this planet. And even the smallest being, a baby born in Bethlehem, 
can bring us back to God. The other really incredible thing about it is that this was not just something that happened. This was something that was foretold through the prophecies of the prophets of the Old Testament in Revelation. It talked about how this was happening. The sun was created as the earth was created, as everything was created, the beginning of time. That this was something to show us that history and our future is all inside of God's hands. He says there's no moral to the story of the shepherds and the wise men and the nativity scene and everything in it, that it is about proclaiming that salvation is nearly at hand. The struggle for us and our forgiveness is almost done. He says that other religions, the deities there, do this, do that, don't do this. I'm going to punish you this way. And instead, Jesus is saying, I'm everything. I came because you couldn't come to me, and I'm here to save you. There's nothing we have to do. And Christianity itself is not about self-improvement. It's about how the good news of Jesus Christ is that he's done everything, and we can't do anything more. He says, quote, you begin with Christ and not by adopting an ethic, nor turning over a new leaf, nor even by joining a community. You begin by believing the report of what has happened in history. And that is, in the end, good news. It's not just good advice. The Bible is not just here to tell us all the things we should and shouldn't do, because it's telling us that Jesus is here to save. He mentions that stories and fables, like Star Wars, start out with once upon a time. He says that in old times, glad tidings would come from messengers because an invading army would be coming into your town. And so they would defeat an army and send messengers up ahead to say, hey, don't flee. Everything's OK. The king just saved you. A messenger of good tiding was to tell you that something's been done and you're saved. And when the messengers of God brought good tiding, it was that the job is almost finished. God is just about done saving us. He says that, you know, a lot of fantasies like Lord of the Rings, there's this mythic belief. It's why we love storytelling. There's a hero and he comes out and he's going to save the world and everything is going to be great. And Hollywood keeps giving us fairy tales. Joseph Campbell always said that there is only really one hero, and that is in the image of Jesus. Now, he thinks it's because we all just write common mythologies, but we know that Jesus coming to save the day is the story, the ultimate history, and our ultimate future. But when we have Lord of the Rings and we have Hollywood stories and Sleeping Beauty, we know that death should not be the end and we should not lose. When we see these amazing stories, good wins out. The victor always gets the girl. The victory always happens with great celebration. And so it shows you how different the message of Jesus is, starting with a genealogy, starting with history, telling us how we got from there to here. It's not a fairy tale. It's a real tale. And you can see it throughout the entire way the story is built. In any other story, Does it come out through a baby to save the world? No, it's a hero, a prince. And if we had a prince and he had an amazing genealogy of people, would that genealogy include a prostitute? Would include someone who murdered another person? Would include someone who had another person's husband killed? Would it include a woman who tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her? That is not the stuff of myth. It's kind of funny because my dad always used to believe that the Bible was some sort of a propaganda piece. And I would be like, a propaganda who? Well, it was the Roman government trying to control everyone. Well, it didn't do a very good job of that. Well, it's the apostles trying to make themselves look really good. It's a propaganda piece. Well, the Bible doesn't do that very well either. These people look like messes. Well, then it's the people in the Bible trying to make themselves look really noble and amazing. That was someone's goal. It did not work. 
Most of the people in the Bible look pretty terrible. And he said that there were 14 generations from Abraham to David and 14 generations from David to the exile in Babylon, and now 14 generations from the exile to Christ. There's a whole other book in there about Daniel and the Babylonian exile and the prophecies in there, which are just amazing. And the reason that's important is because if we had a fairy tale, we would have a short time of some maybe extreme punishment, right? The hobbits were hauled out of their homes. The land was under torture. The trees were being destroyed. But just a short distance away, Aragon comes and saves the day. This was six, seven generations from the beginning. This is a long time. And you have to realize that God is outside of time. He's outside of our thinking about time. When we think about something happening, we think about it happening now. And you have to realize that God is timeless and in control of history. When he fulfills prophecy and he fulfills all the things that were supposed to happen to get to the point where we would have Jesus, he knows when it's going to happen and he knows how it's going to get here. We just don't. And that makes us feel uncomfortable, to be honest with you. The God of the Bible is unique on the planet. Eastern religions have an impersonal God. Western religions sometimes, like the Greek and Romans, had multiple gods. And they just were petty. They just wanted to basically make their own well-being, their own thoughts among the people better. It was always a power play when it came to the Greek and Roman gods. But to the Jewish people... God was a personal and infinite God and created what we expect of that. Jews in the story of Jesus recognized that Jesus was God, that this was a fulfillment of thousands of years of prophecy. They recognized him as that. Everything from lowly fishermen to scholars. But Jesus coming into the shape of man is an amazing miracle in and of itself. We don't think about that. Why become human? Why take on the characteristics? And certainly as a baby, do you know how vulnerable babies are, particularly in that time? I mean, I think a majority of the babies did not live. That's why people had so many children back in old days, because in the end, you probably lost half your children. Being a baby in that time frame, the most vulnerable type of person on this planet is bizarre. Because we realize that he could have come down as a fully grown man. He could have come down with armor and a legion of angels and told us what for. But instead, he told us in the most humble way possible. My pastor used to have a bumper sticker on his office that said, God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. That's in this book, too. But it's true. He didn't send us a report. He didn't send us a message in the sky. He came and got us himself. He came down to be with us and to experience the things that we experience. In most of the religions that existed in the world from that time and even up to now, it's this philosopher, that philosopher, I follow this guy, I belong to the Stoics, I belong to the Epicureans. But instead, this is Jesus saying, I'm changing the world. This isn't about your philosophies. This is about me loving you to save you. And bringing up that in the past, Moses and Abraham couldn't look upon God because his power and an eminence, either when it came to a pillar of fire, whether it came to Moses stepping into the rock so God could pass by, those were ways that God couldn't be looked upon. And when Jesus comes back as a baby in this time of Christmas, It's about him finally connecting to us in a way we can see him, be with him, and talk with him in a way where he can experience the things that we experience. It means that if you feel lonely, you understand that God felt lonely. It's not just about empathy. They're there. I know what you're feeling. It's, I've been there. I felt it too. And how do we meet God? We meet him by talking to him, by praying to him through communion, baptism. We can say our prayers. I read that once that Martin Luther 
like to talk to God as if he was talking to someone who was standing there with him. And I took that on too when I became a Christian. I really appreciated how Luther had conversations with God, not this formal liturgical language, but a God from someone you know, a God who cares about you and has a place in your heart. We talked about that last week, inviting Christ into our heart and having the ability to save us, love us, and comfort us. He says in the end that God coming to earth means a couple of things. First, that we have to have the courage to take on the world. They're going to look down on us. They're going to shun us. They're going to hate us for who we are. We have to have the courage to give up the self. It's easy to say, me, 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 the world is about me. I have to find my true self. And we have to give our conditions, he says. I'll believe you if you do this, or I will travel and be a missionary to this place if you provide housing to me. We want to give conditions to God instead of obedience. Being a Christian is about giving up the I. He says, quote, we need him to name us. He made us. He knows who we are. He knows what we were made for and what will fit us. I think Rick Warren always says that if you want to take a big leap, pray to God to use you in whatever way he wishes. That takes a lot of courage. And then having the courage to admit that we're a sinner, that we haven't done it all. We haven't been kind to our neighbors. We haven't been following God the way we should. And we haven't treated other people in a way that really points to him. So this is part one of the podcast. We're going to talk about this book, the second part of this book, next week. My challenge to you is try to think about one thing next year that you could have courage to do that would help you be more bold, help you get away from the I, 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 or your own conditions, and to step out and have that courage to take on what God wishes for you. Think about it. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening out there. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm trying to do a good job of curating things. I'm finding all sorts of bits and information that you can use in your walk with Christ. Please have a great week and God bless you.